Earlier today, I had the pleasure of catching up with a group of cadets from the Air Force Academy, and they were fortunate enough to sit in on a session with John Penny and Rare Bear. And the class is called the Flight Test Techniques course. And what we do is um, uh, we learn a little bit about theory and aircraft and stuff. These guys have been learning about airplanes their whole you know, three years prior as aero engineers. Uh, but in this class, we go and we actually fly airplanes and try and take data from it. We had a leading edge extension a few years ago to try to reduce drag, which has been taken off here because uh, the crew chief didn't he didn't like the uh, how it was how it was done. But we put a this airplane has limiting Mach of 0.74, and uh, when you take a look at the curvature of the leading edge there and how blunt it is, you can imagine uh, you can imagine how that would be. We. Uh, we, on our leading edge extension, we raise the stagnation point. Everybody knows what a stagnation point is, right? So raise the stagnation point about about an inch, okay? So what's that going to do to the, the local mock on top of the wing if we raise the stagnation point? What's that going to do to the lo local mock number of the airflow on top of the wing? Goes down. Well, you're not supposed to answer that. These guys are supposed to answer it. I heard them say it. I was yeah. repeating. Oh, okay. That local Mach number on top of the wing goes down. So theoretically, and then when you when you start getting a, a mock a mock effects with the airflow over the top of the wing, what happens to your center of pressure? And what happens then? Pitches down, doesn't it? Yeah. So this was all designed to increase our handling qualities for the airplane, and it worked very well. I went up and did a flight test before we put the uh, leading edge extension on, and uh, we, I took it right up to the corner, 0.74 Mach, and uh, 425 knots indicated, which is the, the uh, VMO for the airplane, or V&E. Now, when I would get around about, I started at about 0.68, because we know we started getting some of the Mach effects there, and I started getting an increase in the stick force per G. Everybody knows what stick force per G is. Yes, yeah. So um, as I would increase and step up in a 0.01 mock, right up to 0.74 mock, I was at 0.68, we're getting about um, probably uh, 20 or 30 pounds to pull four Gs, okay? When we got 0.74 mock, I was pulling prop over 100, maybe 120 pounds of force by estimation. I didn't have a stick force gauge. And the nose would just translate very, very slowly. There wasn't any great danger because uh, if there were any issues, all I had to do was pull back on the power, and the thing would slow down anyway. When we put the uh, when we put the leaning edge extension on, we were able to get it to where we could uh, increase the uh, the G level up to about four Gs with only about 70 pounds of force. But I'd start feeling some vibration, a little bit of a little bit of vibration in the airframe. What would cause that vibration in the airframe? Pulling those Gs. Up at that Mach number, we're still getting separated flow from because what happens when you increase angle of attack? What happens to the stagnation point? Well, the stagnation point comes on down. Okay, so when the stagnation point comes down, what happens to the local velocity over the top of the wing? Increases. Increases. So anytime you start increasing the angle of attack when you got a high Mach already, you're going to get that that uh, that shock shock wave stall, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we were still controllable. We also try to move the center gravity aft as far as we can to try to reduce the drag because the wing is lifting, right? What's the tail doing? Downforce. Going down. So when the center gravity is forward, the balancing tail load is higher or lower? Greater. And so when you have a higher balancing tail load, what happens to the total lift vector required on the wing? It goes up, doesn't it? When it goes up, what happens to the drag, the induced drag? It goes up. So <clears throat> there's a balance there. So we try to get the CG as far aft as we can uh, to reduce a balancing tail load, to reduce the total lift vector, to reduce the induced drag, and then we go faster. There's a trade-off to that, because what happens to your stick force per G when the, uh, when the CG goes aft? It goes up. The stick, force, stick force per G goes down, doesn't it? To the point to where you can become uh, your long stat curve crosses the axis, right? It goes negative. We've had that happen once before. Uh, we run we run so uh, aft when we were fully loaded uh, with nitrous oxide and everything. I had one year 
was 1986 when we had 200 pounds of nitrous oxide on board and I was unable to, uh, when I turned the system on, the engine started shaking because the uh, what happened uh, when we got that nitrous on, we increased the BMEP in the cylinder to a much higher level. Everybody, anybody heard the, the phrase BMEP, brake mean effective pressure? Cylinder pressure increases to the point where the coil, the ignition coil couldn't spark, couldn't jump the gap in the spark plugs. And so the cylinder would start laying down. So I had to turn that system off. So we had to race the whole race with, um, uh, race the whole race with um, uh, nitrous oxide on board. So every time we roll into the turn, we get about five pounds of acetic pressure from a neutral chem point. Mm -hmm. And so I had, to, I had to push forward on the stick on the turns and pull back on the straightaway. Does that make any sense? No, it doesn't. You don't want to fly an airplane that way. So, uh, the other thing that, uh, that occurs when we get a really high RPM on the propeller here, and particularly when we have the three-bladed prop that you see leaning on that wall over there, it's quite a bit heavier than this propeller right here. That's, those are blades off the Lockheed P-3 Orion. Everybody familiar with that airplane? The Lockheed P-3. You see the fire tankers, the four-engine uh, turboprop fire tankers? Not the C-130s, those the low-wing guys. They're using uh, Allison turboprops with that, those, those big blades on them. And when we get going around a turn, uh, I get some gyroscopic effects, okay? So the propeller's turning that way, all right? So we're going around a turn, we're increasing our angle of attack, right? When you increase the angle of attack of the airplane for, to make a turn, what happens to your P factor? P factor increases? Mm -hmm. Everybody said yes. Of course it does. Like in a, in, a, in a light airplane, when you take off, which rudder do you step on? Right. Right rudder because of P factor, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So you think when you increase that angle of attack in a turn, you'd be stepping on the right rudder because of the P factor increase. But the gyroscopic forces are dominant in this thing. So uh, what happens is it wants to yaw the airplane's nose to the right, so we end up stepping on the left rudder. It's a little bit evident in this, with this prop, this little bit lighter in that prop, it's very much evident. We could be getting some aeroelastic effects also, but I would find that I was, if I had it trimmed for neutral on the straightaways, we'd be holding about 70 pounds of bottom rudder in the turns when I'm cheated up and we're, uh, we're generating some angular rate. Uh, so I would trim it to where I would help hold, hold about 20 pounds of right rudder on the straightaways and uh, only have to push about 50 pounds of left rudder in the turns. So when we have a big, uh, uh, this thing is, uh, with both these props, uh, the directional stability is, is decreased because of the size of the prop and, um, and the horsepower we're putting to it. So we, have, we don't have a, a turn and slip indicator in the copy. We have a big inclinometer that's about that long, very, very sensitive. So I, during the whole flight, I'm constantly working the rudder pedals to try to keep that ball right, right in, the, in, the, in, the, in the right place. So, well, that's about, you know, uh, any questions? Okay, this is probably stupid, but do you fly it out here, or do you, like, drive it in a trailer? No, the, this airplane, place? pardon me, this airplane lives here now. Oh, okay. Um, you never race anywhere else? It used to live down in Van Nuys, California. I was never comfortable flying it out of Van Nuys. <laughs> Over a populated area, getting it out of there, you know, once I got across the, uh, I forget what name of the pass is, you get north of there, and you can find some place to put it down. But I uh, happily, we've been living here for the last uh, five years. From the Reno Air Aces, I'm Mark Chollis for Plane and Pilot.